The, 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 the impact on civil society has come in many different forms. There, there's the obvious one, there's the cutbacks in funding from every sector, whether it's governments, philanthropy, the public, any other source of funding that you can think of. But, but more than that is the disproportionate cuts that have been taken for those of us whose work is not easily measured in the short term. So if you do rights-based advocacy, if you do human rights defense, if you do that kind of work that is not easy, easily tangibilized, it's not easily reduced to a photo op, it's not easily reduced to a metric, then you've taken a disproportionate hit. The second one is the prioritization around the world in decision making, whether it's in government, market, or civil society, and the media for that matter, of the economic over everything else. So if, for example, you are a community in Kyrgyzstan, which uh, where it's imperative that a pipeline comes through because Western Europe must at any cost liberate itself from Vladimir Putin's hand on those gas valves, then nothing else matters except those pipelines must come through. On the other hand, if you're a human rights defender in Swaziland with very little global economic significance, then you don't exist for anyone except for a brave bunch of Swazi civil society defenders. The third one really was that even the erstwhile champions of democracy, the countries we could count on to occasionally speak up, will not now decide when they want to speak up, if they want to speak up, depending on the geostrategic importance of the perpetrator of those crimes. So if you are a country that controls access to capital, to markets, to natural resources, especially energy, you're more likely to get a free pass from Western governments now than you were even two years ago. In 2009, 2010, for example, Civicus's Civil Society Watch Program tracked over 90 countries, 90. This is half the membership of the UN, who passed laws or policies that had the effect of constraining civil society freedoms in one way or the other. We've seen North and South, the increased criminalization of dissent. You've seen it here in this country where sentences for sending the wrong BlackBerry message can now be four years instead of a night in jail. When, whether it's Greenpeace activists in Japan or whether it's people at the G20 in Toronto, you now face the penalties or the price of dissent has just been escalated. Compounding and exacerbating all of these, of course, is the paralysis in global governance. The, the economist Nouriel Roubini introduced <laughs> the term G0. Um, and it is a more accurate description of global governance at this point in time than any other that I've heard. She says not G7, G8, G20, or G194. The developed world now has domestic priorities that preoccupy them. So America is out to lunch till, what, 2013, Dave, at least, if not longer. Europe has decided its internal problems are more important than any global responsibilities it has. China and India have made it, and South Africa, have made it categorically clear that they're not ready yet or willing to take up any global leadership. They want to be at the global tables to defend their interests, but they have no desire yet to play any global leadership role. And so from monetary and fiscal policy to exchange rates, climate change, trade, financial stability, the international monetary system, energy, food, security, all of these have become zero-sum games where beggar thy neighbor is the preferred strategy rather than the last resort. For civil society at the end of 2010, where we were was we'd taken a decade of this war on terror and, and its impacts. We had started to see the impacts of the financial crisis. We had seen the abject failure of the anti-war protests. We had seen Copenhagen dissolve into nothing before our very eyes, despite the huge mobilization that went into it. And so we ended, many of us, I think, at 2010 with morale abysmally low. And then as the young Egyptian who was part of Group 3 this afternoon, I think she left, but she reminded us of what 2011 has been for us as civil society. Uh, Vladimir Lenin, this is at the, the quote is attributed to him, 
Uh, it goes, sometimes decades pass and nothing happens. And then weeks pass and decades happen. And in the last 12 months, 11 months, literally we have seen decades happen. It is so easy to forget just how much has happened. Four dictators out of office, a new country in Africa, new nuclear annihilation in Japan, earthquakes, floods, cyclones across the planet on, on scales that we've never seen before. Uh, citizen movements from Tunisia and Egypt, but to Delhi and Chile and Israel and here and in Wall Street and in Oakland and across the world of ordinary people saying, we have had enough. This, the common slogan across these have been enough, translated into many different languages. And regardless of whether you think these movements are successful, likely to succeed, partially successful or not, they have achieved at least three things. They have politicized or repoliticized young people and the middle classes on a scale never before seen. These are groups, you remember these are the young people we used to talk about as being the me generation. The ones that as long as we gave them a video game to put stuck in front of their noses wouldn't bother us for weeks. The ones who couldn't care about anything except what brand of trainers they owned. Uh, these are the people that are leading civil society now in achieving transformative change. Uh, the second thing that they've done is achieve a degree of consensus on the loss of faith in institutions across sectors. Government institutions, media institutions, business institutions, they've lost faith in the political class, they've lost space, and, and this has opened up for the first time in my lifetime the room to debate the basic frameworks, the basic paradigms. For the first time in my lifetime, we're not being confronted by that lockstep opposition that says there is no alternative to neoliberalism, to market fundamentalism, to de democracy as certain people defined it. And the third thing that they've achieved is for aging civil society activists around the world like me, renewed faith that citizen mobilization can effect change. So if they achieved nothing more than what they've currently achieved, they've achieved these three things. And they're challenging in fundamental ways the definitions of state, of market, of media, and of civil society, and the relationships between them. They're resisting the imposition by stealth of these new social contracts, where governments are deciding, God knows how, based on what, that well, we need a social protection floor that will ensure that you know, that we don't, nobody gets so deprived that they start throwing bombs through windows or fire, you know, firebombing their neighborhoods. And we need, our only other role is to guarantee a certain modicum of security, so you'll have to take off your shoes when you go through airports. Um, and thirdly, we will, we will deliver some sort of competitive arena where business can do their best or worst. And that social contract was being presented to us as de facto. And these young people around the world have said, heck no. You're not going to do this by stealth. You're going to have to actually negotiate this. The new technologies have enabled it, have facilitated it, have catalyzed it. And they, they've also redefined what we mean when we say transparency. I mean, we're talking now of radical levels of transparency, radical levels of accountability that are inevitable. The, the possibility that, 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 who was I having this conversation with about Bono this morning, that Bono can keep his investment patterns different from his life as a celebrity rocker, different from his life as a social activist, is no longer a possibility. The information is out there and it will be free. There are five key trends that Civicus is detecting in our recent analysis, and there's a report on our website that I would commend to you called Bridging the Gaps. One is obvious, civil society space is volatile and changing. Two, state civil society relationships are limited and mostly unsatisfactory. Three, the financial and human resource challenges for CSOs are continuing and in some cases worsening. It's interesting that in most countries, the human resource challenge is more significant than the financial resource challenge. Four, we're not doing a great job on practicing the values we preach. 
five, that we are most successful when we operate in networks and coalitions, but we don't do that enough, especially in making the links between local and national, national and global. There's a mindset of whether it's INGOs that operate in global forums or whether it's national NGOs that sit in national capitals are being embedded in the power structures to the point where they've completely lost relevance and lost touch with the people on the ground. But if we are actually going to ensure the sort of transformative change that Jeff talked about, the, instead of this fleeting series of mass protests, uh, we're going to have to make an investment in rebuilding these connections between the organized and the less organized, between old traditional forms of civil society and new, new forms of civil society. The message for us, and I'm guessing most of us are, would define ourselves as organized and traditional, from the grassroots is this. We are going to do this with or without you. You have two choices. Help us or get out of the way. Thank you. <laughs>